Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor Elaine Pagels, the Garden of Eden story for Gnostics is seemingly different than the one for the Orthodox view. The serpent doesn't appear to be the bad guy. In some sense, he's actually giving them enlightenment. And I'll elaborate real quick and then just have you take over. I always had this question in my head when God says, do not eat of the tree and the day you do, you will surely die. And as a literalist, I'm going, did they die that day? I, uh, I didn't think they died. No, they that didn't. Day. So did the serpent tell the truth and did <laughs> God lie? You see what I'm saying? I do very much. Well, first of all, um, there's no one way to interpret that story. That is such a provocative story. I mean, just just think of it. It's a very short story. It's about a man, a woman a tree, a talking snake, uh, a <laughs> prohibition. Uh, they're naked and then they're not ashamed. And then what, what is that about? It's, it's a very, uh, it's a Rorschach test kind of, you know, you, you can read into it a thousand different things, cartoons. You can read into it all kinds of work in paintings. Uh, it, it's absolutely extraordinary for the imagination. So you are asking the question that is in one of the famous texts discovered with the secret gospels called the testimony of truth. And the, and the author was saying, wait a minute, what is that story about? Um, when, when God says, on the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die, they don't die? The serpent says, your eyes will be opened and you'll, you will know good and evil. And what happens? The serpent was right. God didn't say what was right. So that author goes on to say, well then, who, how are we supposed to understand the serpent? Well, then the author is a Christian. He goes to the first chapter of the Gospel of John that talks about how um, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and the same way the serpent on a staff is lifted up, the Son of God will be lifted on the cross. So he says, well, who's the serpent then? The serpent is actually Christ, because he's speaking the truth. And, and the one who says you will die on that day is not the right God. It's a small version of God. So they were asking the same questions you are. The story is not to be taken literally. And so there are so many ways people play with that story. That's why I wrote that book, Adam, Even the Serpent, because when Jesus spoke about it, it was because he was asked about divorce. Rabbis read it in a very practical way about what do we mean by marriage? What do we mean by divorce? What's allowed? What isn't allowed? Um, we're talking on that level. And then others read it as a symbolic story. Um, Irenaeus read it a different way um, about, you know, the beginning of sin. And so and Augustine read it as the beginning of original sin, which is a rather extravagant and unusual way to read it, which is now the basis of a lot of Catholic and Protestant teaching. That story has been played um, in more ways than any musical <laughs> right. set of notes. See, I like... Uh comparative mythology because oh, yes. one of the things personally that I per it's my personal interest is I want to know what it originally meant, right? I, I love finding out how people use it, but what it originally meant to me tells me more of the source, right? Like what was the the point, the polemic? What was the intention, the original audience, whatever it might have been, I want to know that because we all use things to our own personal context. For example, you open the newspaper, there's probably an evangelical right-wing Christian who's interpreting the book of Revelation or some book or prophecy in the Bible to say, look, what's going on with Israel right now? Look at what's going on, the bombing. Oh, yeah. You know, the end is near, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, 
What did it mean when it was written? And it, oh, did you want to? Well, that's a very good question. And it's hard to answer because this story was probably told 3,000 years ago. That's when it was written, we think. And, and if you ask a rabbi, well, they'll say, well, the story is written to say you're a human being and you have different impulses. You have what they call the evil impulse and the good impulse within you. And what I want to teach you as a rabbi is you should obey God. You should obey Torah, which is the way God teaches us how to live. It's a way of life that is life-affirming and productive and will lead you in the right path. You shouldn't disobey Torah, the, the Word of God. So the story is about Adam and Eve, and they're given instruction by God, and Adam does not obey God, and the result is suffering. That's why we suffer. That's why we die. That's why there's oppression in the world. Right. Um, that's why men labor you know, with the earth and suffer in, in agricultural labor and women labor in giving birth. Um, everybody suffers. And that's, that's because we disobey God. But if you follow Torah, that's, that's a story about following one impulse or the other. And we want you to get the message that you should follow the right way and obey God. Right. So I think that's what the story, that's the most original cast I could put on it. I was going to say, one of the things that I was coming across that made me think, where did this come from, was looking at the Mesopotamian, the Ugaritic, yes. you know, the... Oh, the where does that come from? You mean literarily and culturally? Yes, and, and I wonder because we know Israel, we know that they were bumping into uh, Sumerian, uh, they, were cap you know, they were captured by Babylonian, if you will, uh, the Babylonians, and then, of course, the Assyrians, and then you had the Medes, and you had Persians, and so there's all these backdrop stories that they have, their mythology, their origin stories. And, you know, Epic of Gilgamesh comes into the Noah's sure. type of thing. Like, there's ah. so many connections to make with these comparative mythologies. Well, when you talk about, you know, what is, how did they originate literarily and culturally, I think most people would say, the stories of creation in the Hebrew Bible, the two of them, the first one, you know, the story of the creation in seven days uh, is a response to the Babylonian creation story, and which speaks about the powers of the universe, the sun god and the moon god, and the Israelites say, no. Mm -hmm. We worship a being that created what you call God, the sun is not a god. The moon is not a god. They are lights in the sky that our god made, much bigger than your gods. Mm -hmm. Your gods are just things. Our god is a transcendent reality. So this is a way that Hebrew people responded to the Babylonian stories. And sort of it's a one-upmanship right. to say our god is much bigger than your gods. Your gods are just inanimate beings. Our God is a transcendent reality. And that's what made me think um, there might be something there that we can glean and learn that doesn't get looked at in Orthodox circles, whether Jewish Orthodoxy or Christian. They don't, they don't care about that. They don't really see how that might matter. And to me, that does matter. It plays a huge role in these narratives. It, it does. And all, one thing it does, Derek, which I think is significant in the 21st century, is it teaches that the human being is not part of nature. That is, nature is nature, and nature is things. It is rocks and mountains and stars and, and planets and sun and moon, and we are above that. That's all created for us. We, Adam and Eve, are humans and they're made in the likeness of God and they're told to dominate the world and subdue it. And that has a legacy of saying we are not really part of this. Hmm. Which in the 21st century we're looking at it and saying, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe we are part of it. Right. And dominating and subduing it has led to destruction of the environment that we need to survive. Good point. So there are people now who speak about 
conservation, who speak about preserving the climate and the earth so far as we can. And they go back to the Genesis story and say, we are caretakers, not meant to be masters of the earth, which has created a domineering mentality toward nature. But we are meant to be participants and caretakers. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to transform the interpretation of it for a society that should care for the earth and not try to simply, you know, uh, monetize it or dominate it. There's so much there too when you start looking at this connections to the to the uh, Sumerian or Ugaritic and so right. Like, there's the idea of um, of uh, gods creating man to work for them because they were working their butts off and they were like, hey, we don't want to do this anymore to Marduk. And Marduk's like, all right, I'm going to make man, makes man. Then they're too loud and noisy, so he sends a <laughs> flood. And then you have the biblical explanation for why a flood. And right, but, but the gods that you speak about are the, the natural world. And that's a very different world than the one that the Hebrews chose to interpret. Right. Yeah, because they had the, there's the, ta well, Deuteronomy 32 and then Psalms talks about this whole, there's a council of gods, but it's still not taking, it's not a earthly thing, so to speak. It definitely transcends, which is the difference, I think. The God of the Hebrew Bible creates the world, but the God of, of the God of Mesopotamia is, is the sun God that, that is the forces of nature are themselves the divine powers. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's very different, and the Greek Greek and Roman religion is that too, you know. It makes me think of Prometheus too, like the yeah. whole story. Doctor Price that I interview all the time, he talks about how you have this story where um, Prometheus and, and Zeus, and he makes man, of course, and um, he makes them for sacrifice, so they could sacrifice to, to oh, him yes, for food. Yes, yeah. And Prometheus tricks him one day and gives him like a jar with. Full of fat and guts, nasty, with a top layer of sirloin, if you will. Here you go. And then he takes the good stuff and puts a fat layer on top to make it look like he has the guts, because that's what he would always get. And he tricks Zeus, and Zeus gets mad. And now he curses Prometheus and yes. mankind. And it's like, what? This sounds too much like another origin story. Right. It's just, I like the comparative Well, stuff. it is fun, and I do too. I, I work with that. I, I teach a course called... God and Satan, goddesses and monsters. And we, we study Gilgamesh and, and the Babylonian creation story. I've got to visit you on one day. I'm, I'm doing it right now, <laughs> but like really diving into this. It so. is fun.